Okay, here we go. Here we go. Now Twitter has just changed the icon and it says Rupert is a speaker. Hello, Rupert. No, Rupert's put his mic on mute. You have to unmute your mic. There we go. Wow, there we go. Okay, it, Rupert. <laughs> we have success. Do you Finally. Know, do, you know the joke, do you know the joke, Matthew, that nowadays meetings, uh, online meetings are a little like seances? You know, can you hear me? Is I, anyone there? <laughs> I can, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I can, I can hear you. We can, it says Twitter says that you're a speaker. You can hear me. And it's all being recorded as well, so we can update the podcast. Yeah, okay, Madrid users putting the little two fingers up there. With two fingers, V for victory, not the other two fingers in English. And uh, <laughs> and, and so I, I assume that now everybody can also hear what's going on. So let's go. Rupert, could you please briefly, for people who don't know you, have never come across you before, just briefly explain who you are and what relation you have to Spain. How long have you been here? Sure. Uh, I graduated in philosophy in the UK in 1991, in the middle of a recession. There wasn't much demand for philosophers, so I moved to Madrid and became an English teacher, learned Spanish. And, uh, but I wasn't very happy as an English teacher, so I moved back to the UK after a few adventures and uh, retrained as a journalist. I got sent back to Spain from 97 to 2000 with Dow Jones as a foreign correspondent. Okay. Uh, fell, fell in love with a Spanish girl who and uh, came up with a good job in London, so took her back with me, and uh, we ended up getting married, having our first kid. And uh, we started looking around for interesting projects that would bring me bring us back to Spain. I ended up working for a startup, a, a journalism startup called Merger Market. Uh, in 2005, uh, I moved back to Spain and opened up the office for them an investigative journalism job uh, about financial journalism uh, and uh, been been here ever since doing investigative journalism about about finance and having a look letting off a little bit of steam on twitter okay great so you've been here for uh, uh like me for for over 20 years uh, your relationship with spain uh yeah let me say it's my youngest daughter plus one that's 16 plus six 22 years 22 years okay i i first came here in 1998 so that gives us about 22 23 years perhaps as well so we're about the same then and you live in barcelona uh, exactly. When I when I moved back to Spain in 2005, uh, I the the solution we came up with was that uh, we, we were going to have a two person bureau. And I thought that if we had two people in Madrid, we would lose Catalonia. But it but Catalonia is not half the economy. So the solution we came up with was that we'd have an office in Madrid, a, a colleague of mine in Madrid, uh, and I would live in Barcelona and go to Madrid most weeks. And eventually, after doing that for 10, 12 years, uh, stopped going to Madrid quite so regularly. <laughs> so so uh, a philosopher my trained... Is, a philo- my colleague Iñaki, who is based in Madrid, is actually on this course. So I'll just say, give, give, give a shout out to him. Hi, hello to Iñaki. Well done, Iñaki. Um, so... A philosopher trained as a journalist who's been living in Spain for more than 20 years and who also has been in Barcelona. So you lived through the whole evolution of the Catalan separatist process, especially over the last 10 or 11 years. Uh, exactly. And that was uh, <laughs> certainly interesting. And, and, and as someone who's British, the joke I always make is I had a double dose of, of uh, populist nationalism with Brexit and the Catalans. Right. So lots of things that we can talk about today then with your background and training and education and experience in Spain. Let's let's do it. So the title of your article that, that gave gave way to this chat today uh, was Dismantling the Narrative that Spain is a Fascist State. So there are all sorts of things we could do with that to start with. Uh, why does it need that? Why does the narrative exist? What What is this narrative that exists, especially in foreign media, right? Especially in foreign media coverage of what's going on in Spain. What is the narrative and why does it exist? Uh, I think that's a great question. And I, I must say, there's something I didn't mention in the article is that I actually brought into the narrative myself. When I was an English teacher, I was learning Spanish. I used to read El Jueves re- religiously, you know, satirical magazine as a way of getting my Spanish up to speed. And they every week would run jokes about the PP being kind of secretly fascist. And I kind of bought into it myself. And I was a little bit surprised when I became a foreign correspondent during Aznar's uh, time as prime minister to actually meet ministers from the PP and go to their press conferences and cover them and find that actually these guys aren't fascists at all. You know, I, I was coming from a left-wing background uh, and I might not necessarily have agreed with them on everything, but you go, well, okay, you know, you can see they're just 
conservative people, but uh, maybe maybe Catholic or whatever, economically liberal. But you know, paint, trying to paint them as, as fascists just seemed completely wrong. So this was something I realised, you know, back in ninety seven, ninety eight. Uh, and uh, but but the narrative is very widespread. Uh, I think particularly among left wing people, and it explains a l once you realise that people just assume that the PP is a fascist party, it explains a lot of what uh, of what of what you see in Spain. For example, just the other day, um, a Podemos a Podemos delegate was uh, was found guilty of kicking a policeman a few years ago and he went into uh, he went into the parliament and got got a standing ovation from left wing politicians you know it, uh, in other countries that would be insane you know if a, if a politician goes and kicks a, uh, a police officer that's a bad thing the only reason they can see it as not being necessarily bad is this kind of idea that the police and the pp and the establishment and the monarchy is in some way corrupt or illegitimate very widespread belief uh particularly after Zapatero's time and you would say that the 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 the, the crux the the core of this <laughs> narrative is that spain is still a fascist state then the base the basic crux of it all i, I would say the idea is that Franco was a uh, a completely um, uh, straightforward fascist throughout his entire the entire time he was in in uh, in power right up to his death in 1975, and the the transition was tainted by contact by contact with with uh, w with Franco, and so you know the constitution the constitution allegedly had these kind of fascist elements which make it invalid. Right, and it was fascinating. Yeah, that, what you said just a second ago was fascinating. You at first believed the narrative when you in the first yeah, few years. I, I think it's it. very widespread. I'd love to see some research on how widespread it is. But certainly, my my experience of you know, I have uh, I know lots of Spanish people, lots of friends and relatives and things, and you know, it's surprisingly common the idea that the PP is kind of fascistic and that the establishment is fascistic and the police are fascistic. And what what yeah. was it in in your own life or in your own evolution and understanding of Spain? What was it that one day made you realise that wasn't the case? Well, as as I mentioned before, I was a foreign correspondent. Uh, I was quite young when I was a foreign correspondent with Dow Jones. So I moved here in ninety seven. I was twenty six. It was just before my twenty seventh birthday. And part of my job was uh, to stay in touch with the economic ministry. Uh, uh, Rato was the minister at the time, and he had uh, people like, and he had a team. And we had to go to their speeches and go to their press conferences and go to these briefings. And we got to meet them and got to got to know them. And at the same time, I was learning about economics and finance and began to see. Hey, actually, you know, they, these guys aren't fascists. You know, they're just they're just right of centre, and they're not. You know, if you compare them with the UK Conservatives, they're not even very right wing. <laughs> and I, I I feel like there's a there's a perception in Spain that uh, Podemos is left wing, the P, the socialists are so, uh, the socialists are centrist, the PP is is, is, uh, Ciudadanos is is right wing, and the PP is the far right. But when you map that onto a kind of international uh, comparisons with with other uh, international parties in the West, it's completely wrong. Podemos is one of the most far left parties in the West. Ciudadanos is very very centrist. The the the, the, the socialists are very centre left. The the the, the PP are very centre right. And uh, and I think people people in Spain uh, systematically get this wrong by not making comparisons with other countries, and they also see the nationalists as being somehow left wing, which I think is uh, a misinterpretation. Nationalism tends to be right wing, and uh, the nationalists tend to get a free pass when they're doing things that, if they were doing it at, at a kind of national level rather than a regional level, would clearly be be seen as wildly right wing. Right, so that's a that's a great way of sort of summing the whole thing up very broadly over many of those years. But let's look, let's try and follow the, the 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 thread of your article a little bit and go and go back to the start, and then we'll get back to all of this fascinating stuff uh, a, a bit later on. So you you trace this narrative back to the transition in the 1970s, right, with the transition of power from the Franco regime mm. to the new democracy via the the then young King Juan Carlos. 
Yeah, I, w- I would say that the narrative... Uh, let me tell you a really interesting point that a friend of mine made during Zapatero's years. Uh, and she said that uh, all the previous socialist politicians have based their identity and their values on the transition to democracy. But Zapatero, when he started talking about, the, about republicanism and the civil war, you know, part of that was positive when he was talking about digging up the, the bodies of the, of, the victo- of the victims of Frank in the, in the civil war. There's nothing whatsoever wrong with that. But she said that it was potentially very dangerous for him to start basing his identity on the, on the civil war rather than on the transition to democracy. I thought she was probably uh, uh, exaggerating a little bit at the time. I turned out to be completely wrong. I think she she absolutely nailed it at the time. But what happened is with with, with Zapatero, the socialists stopped thinking so much about the about the uh, about the transition and started thinking mu- much more about the republic and the civil war, and uh, that made them maybe a little bit more vulnerable to these narratives which had always existed on the fringes. Lots of people on the Spanish right especially uh, date those the, the changes that have happened over the past 15 years or so uh, to that Zapatero era and that change of mentality yeah. in politics or that way of doing politics, those political references. I, but what they, were try, I, what they were trying to do and have been trying to do since is, is something that you also reference in your article which was this business in the 1970s of the amnesty and the sort of cultural political acceptance of, okay, let's not really talk about all of that and let's just get on with democracy and the transition and becoming a modern country, finally. And when Zapatero arrived uh, in, in the 2000s, then he tried to uh, revert that or go back to that or revisit that with this idea of historical memory, didn't he? And now Sanchez, of course, is continuing with that, but go on. Uh, absolutely, and I think that's uh, that, 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 that's absolutely fair commentary. Uh, and I think that the, the the problem is not so much with historical memory in itself; it's in the way that the his, historical memory is done. And the socialists realised, I think, around the time of Tapatero, that if you do your historical memory in a slightly one-sided, partisan way, people on the right will hate it and abstain or vote against it and that then gives you a stick that you can beat them with you can say they're doing this because they're fascist and uh, i think historical uh, historical memory if it's done well has to look at the reasons for the failure of the republic and what the republic did wrong uh, and have a much wider conversation bring in um bring in catholic voices for example do, do you, th- do you that, think there is a place uh, before, for, for but, sorry, uh, but, 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 and i'm not saying coming to this from a right-wing perspective i'm just coming to, to, from the perspective if you look at what happened in south america with the uh, sorry, south africa with the truth truth and reconciliation committee it looked at all sorts of problems problems from apartheid obviously but also problems from the from the opponent of apartheid and they try to do something as wide as possible that to, 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 to help uh to get, help heal the society and i think that kind of uh broadness has been missing from the historical memory but it was present in the transition right do you think generally there there is a or there should be or there is a place in the evolution of Spanish politics and society, given everything that happened all of those years ago and the way that different generations of politicians took about trying to manage that over time. Do you think at this point, or at that point in 2005, 2008, that there, there is a, an argument for revisiting that? Absolutely. I think that there is a very strong case for historical memory, but it has to be based on consensus and it has to be done well. And basically the left has to renounce using it for partisan reasons to try and paint the right as heirs to fascism and themselves as heirs to uh, trying to divide it into goodies and baddies basically we're the goodies they're the baddies no 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 no. it was a the history was complex and uh you need to stop being stop doing it in a way that you think will give you an electoral advantage. And I think if you have that spirit of generosity from the left to be able to discuss some of the mistakes that were made on uh, by the Republic as well, it would be much less threatening for the right and the right might then be able to participate in it. Trying to stick for a minute to the earlier periods that you made sure. reference. No, no, that's always my fault. Well, they, they t- just, to, just to try and 
follow some kind of structure here. The, uh, the, we, back to Franco and the transition. Mm-hmm. You say in your article that it's not as simple as saying Franco was a fascist and a bad guy and that was that. Over the years, over the decades, what Franco was evolved and changed. And I think it's very important to just uh, proceed these comments by saying this is not a, uh, a justification of Franco. I think there's a lot of revisionism, and I think we need to be very careful, careful to stay clear of that. That Franco was obviously a right-wing dictator. Lots of people were slaughtered. The civil war was brutal. He did a, he did a coup against democracy. And we're not trying to say that that was good or to, uh, to whitewash his image or whatever. But when you look at the scholarship on fascism and you come up with the definitions of, of fascism, it's, it's surprising to see that not everyone thinks that Franco was a full-blooded fascist. And I think one of the reasons for that is that he was obviously very Catholic and that fascism tended to have a uh, an anti-religious streak, fascism in Italy and Germany. Franco also, Spain was exhausted at the end of the Civil War, so he didn't join World War II. And uh, after World War II, and he then started to distance himself a little from, from, the, from the fascism. By the 1950s, he signed an agreement with the Americans. He then brought in people from the open state to liberalize the economy. And I think this is a, a, a very interesting point in, in Spain, that econ, because economic liberalism happened under Franco's watch, people tend to think that economic liberalism is in some way fascistic, which is a, a very simple-minded, simple-minded uh, view. But the Spanish left, in your opinion or your appreciation of this, as well as foreign media, cherry-pick the Franco area for data points and events and interpretations that reinforce their current narratives. Exactly. There's a, now, uh, if, if I can just step back a little and give a, give a little bit of wider content. I published the article on, on my blog, which is called Sharpen Your Axe. Uh, it's a blog about, criti- about thinking critically about narrative. One thing that I've noticed over the years is that people spread big black and white narratives about the world. They then, as you mentioned correctly, uh, cherry pick examples. They, they ignore counter examples. And you know, you see this all the time with conspiracy theories, but you also sit in gurus selling, you know, uh, magic potions for health, and you sit for populist politicians who have one simple explanation for everything that's gone wrong in the world. And, you know, I think, you know, coming from a philosophical background, investigative journalism, I think that it's very difficult to get one narrative that explains anything. Narratives can often contain a seed of the truth, but, you know, they, we need to have a more nuanced view and to be a little bit more critical. And what would so you say, I, what would you say the main pieces that are cherry picked are and what is the main nuance that people miss out okay great question i think the the, the, the what what people do when they do with with the narrative is that they take some facts and they, they are facts that for example article two of the constitution which says that spain were uh, uh, spain is indivisible you know that was came late in the negotiations and was supposed to come from the armed forces you know and uh, the pp was founded by fraga who had been a minister under franco and uh uh, you know, they, 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 people take these facts and then just try and use them to try and taint it and imply that the Constitution is in some way undem- undemocratic. And we can see that the Constitution is not undemocratic. It's very easy to do. Anyone can do this themselves in, in five minutes in Google. Go, Google the Economist uh, Intelligence Unit the, uh, Democracy Index, and you'll see that, that Spain is one of the, uh, one of the few uh, full democracies in the world. Google Freedom House Spain, and you'll see that it qualifies Spain as free. So we can just see that there's something wrong with the narrative right there. And what to say in the article is that what's gone wrong with the with the narrative is that it misses a lot of the context. And the context was that the uh, was that the transition uh, was meant to be very broad. It was meant to bring in everyone from communists to nationalists to liberals to conservatives to socialists uh, to hardliners under Franco who realised that. They needed to modernise, you know, and needed to bring them together and uh, agree on some some ground rules for liberal democracy, and uh, and I think the constitution did that very successfully. 
And if you look at Article 2, it's not dissimilar from uh, articles you see in other, in other constitutions. For example, France has a similar, uh, has a similar uh, uh, article in its, uh, as a, in its own constitution, as does Portugal, for example, which transitioned to democracy a couple of years before Spain, of course. So, so in functional terms, in 2021, the Economist Intelligence Unit classifies Spain as a full democracy, one of the 23 yeah. full democracies. But in cultural, historical, social, political, rhetoric terms, there's still this problem with the past. Exactly. And people... And then people look, look for anecdotal evidence, you know, uh, for example, oh, this one judge who's an old guy and he used to be involved with something with Franco, so that makes him illegitimate. But it doesn't matter very much when the law that this judge is, is, uh, is ruling on is a democratic, is a democratic rule. He might, he might be an old-fashioned guy with, uh, with, with views that many of us would disagree with, but he didn't write the law himself. And the law itself, when you compare it to other countries, might not be particularly bad. I, when, I, I think we, one, of the, we, one of the important things here is to always have some context, always compare Spain with another country when, when someone uh, says that it's fascistic. You know, people will say, it's, Spain is fascistic because blah, 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 blah. And then you go, well, okay, let's compare it to some other countries and see what happens there. And you see that generally the, the thing that people say is fascistic is totally mainstream in other countries. Right. And I was going to say that when we arrived in Spain, sort of at the end of the 1990s, both of us, I, certainly looking back on that period and over how things have changed since then, for the first few years, at least until, say, Zapatero, like you say, in sort of 2005 or 2008 or that, that kind of period, there, Spain had solved the problem. It wasn't that this debate, these debates about identity in the past didn't really exist, did they? There was a problem with ETA still, of course, and... There were, but the, this business of the, the the generation of politicians who had done the transition uh, had made it work uh, up, up until we, we arrived or up until Zapatero uh, came along later on. Uh, yeah. And then these identity debates and revisions of the past have, have surged since then. I, I agree. I actually arrived in 91, so a few years before that I went back. But I think that I think you're absolutely right, Matthew. And I think that uh, the, the narratives were there. As I mentioned at the beginning, I used to read El Jueves, you know, the satirical magazine, and it spread these narratives <laughs> very regularly. <laughs> when, he, when he talked to people in the streets, they would be uh, very uh, uh, receptive to these kind of narratives which didn't really uh, you didn't really see them in mainstream politics or the media until Zapatero kind of let the lid off a little bit and it exploded later around 2012 with Pablo Iglesias of course Do you think it was a mistake not to talk about all of this at the time in the 1970s? Uh I, I'm not sure. I think that's a great question. And obviously you can only run <laughs> one version of the universe at a time. Uh, I obviously wasn't around in Spain and I was just a kid at the time. So very difficult to, very difficult to answer. I think it could have been done differently. But the, the impression I get when I talk to older people was that everyone was very paranoid that democracy wouldn't take root. And so they kind of went for the safest way. And I think for a long time in the 80s and 90s, the transition was seen as absolutely the correct way to change a society. Yes. And, I, and I think if you turn the question around, look at a country like Venezuela now. And if, for example, uh, senior people in Maduro's re regime said, look, okay, we'll get rid of Maduro. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll turn Venezuela back into a liberal democracy. But we want a promise that we won't go to prison. I think you should bite their hands off for that deal. Yeah, I, I, it's a tough one, isn't it? We can't go back and, and, and redo history, of course. But then at the same time, and it, it's, it's, from, from an academic or a political point of view, it's easy to understand. It's easy. It's, 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 uh, those arguments are understandable. And it worked for all of those years afterwards, at least for a generation, I would say, afterwards. Yeah. And, I, yeah. But, but, but when I see some of the reporting now, for example, about these these very old people who are close to dying and who have in some cases died now because they were so very old. Um, and they spent so many years, I mean, people like James Badcock and the Telegraph and things have done some good reporting on this in English. Um, they, they've spent their whole lives basically trying to 
find and reclaim the remains of their parents or uncles or brothers or whoever it was from the Civil War. And it's taken them so very long and it's been a struggle for their whole lives. And in some cases, some few cases now, they've, they've, they've managed it. But in most cases, they haven't. And now they're passing away themselves. And it just seems to me, from, a, from a, while, while it's understandable from a political point of view, and, and in understanding the history of the evolution of modern Spain, I, I read those stories sometimes and think, crikey. I mean, if you, you spent your whole life trying to get mum or dad or your brother back. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think... Uh that is the aspect of historical memory that Spain has handled badly. And uh, Zapatero was, was probably right when he said that they needed to start thinking about those kind of things. I think what he got wrong was to not try and do it in an inclusive way. You know, he should have called on Preston, the historian, and you know, got, got him to chair a commission and invited the Catholic Church in and, and the Franco Foundation and you know, got people from the other side as well and tried to do something that was a little bit more global and, and, and just taken the politics out of it. And I think that would have been uh, positive, for, positive for Spain. And Sanchez, of course, continued with that policy of identity politics and, and sort of party political ways of looking at this when he dug up Franco before the COVID pandemic? Well, I think Sanchez is a, is a very, he's obviously a divisive figure. And I think the great tragedy of Spanish politics uh, nowadays is that a moderate from the, from the Socialist Party and a moderate from the PP probably have more in common than they do, than they do with someone from Podemos or someone from Fox. And uh, there's just a culture where they can't do deals with each other. You, you know, you don't see that in Germany, for example, where you have a socialist serving in a con in a conservative-led uh, government. You just and, you just touched uh, on something you know, very just very this important. Barrier right down the middle of Spanish politics, which is very unhelpful and kind of brings extremists into coalition. I was going to say you just touched on something very important I think because as well as all of the the evolution of this historically in Spain we also had the global technological internet mobile phone social media evolution at the same time especially over the past 10 years and now things have just become much more divisive everywhere I think and in Spain particularly because of those underlying divisions perhaps and whereas before with the old politics the Socialist Party and the Conservative Party, the Popular Party, were able to sort of do high-level political deals on different things quietly without ruffling anybody's feathers. In the modern 2021 era, and for the past few years, it's just got worse, I think, the, the, yeah. the political parties now are sort of entrenched in their own ideological and identity positions, and they can't really leave them because as soon as they say or do something, everybody sees it on Twitter or YouTube. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think it's, it's very sad. And this is the big, the big problem in, in Spanish politics at the moment. Ciudadanos was obviously set up to, to overcome it. And Rivera took a number of bad decisions and, uh, and ended up reinforcing the division rather than uh, overcoming it. Right. Um, we can get back to that in a minute. Let's keep going with the with the flow of things. Um, what happened? How did how did Catalan separatism or the Catalan independence movement? You you lived through that from Barcelona as a as a reporter and a philosopher. How did that start to feed into things around the same time as Zapatero? Okay, I think that these narratives had always been spread uh, on the fringes. Uh, uh, but, uh, Catalan separatism was a minority movement when I moved to Barcelona in 2005. You know, it was uh, the uh, ERC used to get a number of votes, a small number of votes. I think it was about 10% on average in most elections. So, so it was there, the narratives were there, but the mainstream uh, nationalists were... Uh, very uh, invested in the constitution and the institutions and so forth. I think that things started to change with the big recession and uh, the corruption cases that started to come out. And it was 
clearly an elite-led uh, movement. There's, there's some interesting research, I, I linked to it in the article, from Nature magazine, which uh, did a statistical analysis of when people started to switch to, to Catalan uh, separatism. Really interesting analysis. I don't, I don't know if you saw the article, Mackie, but it's... It, it, but, the, the, the mythology says that it's when the, uh, the Constitutional Court cut back some of the clauses on the, uh, on the Estatut, on the regional statutes. It says that that was, what wasn't the case at all. It was when the regional government started to spread these kind of narratives on the, uh, on the, on the, uh, the, the, the public media. After Artur Mas decided he would get on board in 2011 and 2012. Uh, exactly, and uh, you, there was a big change in TV3, you know, the the, 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 the Catalan public uh, public TV, and you could just see it in the numbers, which you, you, I, I reckon everyone clicked through to the Nature article, it's really interesting, yeah, and you can just see that as that happened, people started to define themselves, the Catalan speakers started to define themselves as, as separatists. Why do you think and, the Catalan political but, elite decided to jump on the separatist issue after so many years of getting along in the old transition mindset with everybody else? I think, uh, do, do you remember there was a case when uh, lots of populists, I think it was the Indignados, surrounded the Catalan parliament and there's lots of shouting and rock throwing and people had to escape by helicopter. Uh, I can't remember exactly what year it was, but it was around 2011, 2012. And, and the change happened almost immediately afterwards. You know, I think they were just, they saw that there was a bit of fire, a bit of anger, and thought, how can we use this to stay in power rather than have it used against us? People were very angry, you know, as, as, as you know, Matthew, during the, the recession was just awful for ordinary people. Lots of people lost their jobs, people lost their homes, people were really worried about the future. And it was kind of the perfect environment for people to sell extremist uh, solutions or black and white solutions in politics, you know, something's gone wrong with the world and if we fix this one thing then everything will be fine. And when people are kind of worried about uh, being evicted at the end of the month, they're much more receptive to those kind of narratives than when uh, they've got money in the bank and everything's ticking along nicely. It's funny how all of these global changes, systemic changes over the years, feed into one another and produce a changed world compared to the one even the one that you and I arrived in at the end of, in the 1990s um, but yeah. some but somehow somehow Spanish politics and Spanish political debate is so very stuck still in those previous I, years I yeah, I absolutely agree. And my, my background as a financial journalist, we uh, write a lot about startups and innovation and, uh, you know, ESG, which is, ESG is probably the, uh, the the biggest trend in the world right now, the most important trend. It means environmental, social and governance investment. And it means investors putting money aside to help companies like Repsol transition into green energy. And uh, it, it's changing the world. And you give Spanish politics continues as if it was the 19th century with you know conservatives and social democrats and nationalists and you know I, I think the one positive thing we've seen in Spanish politics in the last couple of years has been Sanchez government actually doing a startup law you know about time that the government started thinking about startup. Yeah, or well now I think just just what I've been looking at over the last few weeks with this business with Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. It feels to me, I mean, beyond the 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 issue of whether or not it's going to be useful for us for for me to do more more journalism with readers and things as an issue as a global issue reading around it and and trying to understand how it works it feels like it's about to happen again with with this business of bitcoin and cryptocurrencies happening at a global level and the level of preparation in spain in terms of uh, legislators or politicians or policies or uh, people moving to deal with that seems to be extremely low yeah, I agree. And I think there's an issue with Spanish politics that I speak to a lot of people in finance and they tend to have, be very bright people, finance and business. They tend to be very bright people, very good educations. They've all got their uh, master's degrees and their MBAs and things and they all take views on the future. And you very rarely see these people go into politics. 
I can only think of probably two exceptions. One is Luis de Guindos, uh, the former finance minister for the PP. And uh, it was amazing. In, uh, before the, uh, in about 2011, he went around a series of conferences in Madrid with a PowerPoint saying, this is what I would do if I was finance minister. It's like create a public bank, do this, do that, do that. And eventually, of course, the PP won the elections. He became the finance minister. And he went through his PowerPoint and did it one by one and got Spain out of a recession. He was obviously a, a top investment banker before that. And uh, the other person is Ines Aremada, who was a consultant, has worked in English, you know, has, uh, has a good level. But, uh, and I suppose you get uh, Gary Cano as well, uh, Cicerano's uh, economics guru, who's a um, very senior uh, economist at the LSE. So three people off the top of my head who come from the, 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 this forward-looking business finance world and try and set things right in 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 politics, but it just doesn't happen often enough, and uh, it certainly doesn't happen very often on the left, unfortunately. I interviewed the the deputy editor of La Vanguardia a few years ago, en Enrique Juliana. Uh, I think it was like two, 2014 when Podemos was just a. Uh, Turn, uh, turning up on the scene and everybody was wondering what it really was and I interviewed him in his offices in Madrid and he said well we talked about Podemos and all the rest of it as well but I remember him saying much the same thing in terms of Spanish politics as a whole and he said that his, his idea then was that the 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 one the major problem with Spanish politics was that barrier to entry for good quality intelligent people to want to leave the private sector for a few years and dedicate themselves to public life with their intelligence. Yeah, and I think that uh, a part of it is because, uh, you know, obviously we're British, so we're probably slightly biased, but having a list-based system encourages uh, loyalty, and that can easily turn into rewarding yes-men. And what you can get in a system that rewards yes men is actually being unqualified becomes uh, becomes uh, an advantage because it means that uh, they haven't got any other options. So you know they just uh, uh, nail their colours to the to, to, to the mast and will be loyal and they'll go down with the ship and you know you can trust that person. Do you think the the technology and the media environment has shifted as well over the past few years to stop? politics evolving in the right direction is it is it is it part of the problem now uh, that's a very good question i probably have to sit down and think about it for a week to give you a good answer <laughs> but but my my uh my impression is that the media is very much divided on the left right axis and i think that there are some interesting things happening with publications like El Español, uh, you know, more liberal centrist publications, which I think they tend to veer a little bit more to the left, but I think there's definitely a space for uh, more kind of uh, publications that uh, span the left-right division. And uh, this might be going off on a tangent, Matthew, but, but if you'll let me, uh, I'll, I'll explain how I see it in terms of the big picture. That liberalism is the most uh, is the most successful ideology in the West, uh, but it's not necessarily very good at winning elections. And what we saw after the First World War, liberalism stopped being uh, a successful electoral force in the West, and it split. So liberalism has three parts: it has uh, liberal democracy, social liberalism, and economic liberalism. What happened with the left? got uh, got liberal democracy and social liberalism, and the right got liberal democracy and economic liberalism and you, you get systems where you used to kind of alternate between the two b b between the two so the left are in power they'll raise taxes a bit more and regulate a bit more but and make people a little bit more free in their in their daily lives and then the right would take power and do the opposite they'd lower taxes and be pro-business and a bit more laissez-faire in economics but then they'd kind of maybe be a little bit more authoritarian or traditionalist on, on social issues. And I think that started to change in the 90s with uh, uh, Clinton and Blair, who realized you could put the three elements back together. And they were both coming from the left and they were adding a little bit of economic liberalism to kind of uh, left-wing social democratic uh, uh, parties. And 
very successful electro, uh, from an electoral point of view for a time. I think once you, once, you, once you see it like that, populism is much easier to understand. Populism is a rebellion against liberalism. But now we are. We, but now we are in that different era, aren't we? Now we've shifted now to on, on a global level. We, we could talk about Trump or Brexit or the the yellow jackets in France and all of this business over the past few years in ver- in many different countries in Western democracies who all in one form or another have had to try, try to to uh, to deal with this. And now we, it seems to be getting worse, not better. Seems to be becoming more radical, not less. Absolutely. Yeah. But I think the issue is that populists aren't, one thing that we learned from COVID, populists aren't very good at governing. <laughs> you look at the guy in Brazil, Bolsonaro, you know, he was just rubbish. He just couldn't manage the, uh, manage the uh, pandemic at all. And so that tends to mean that populists aren't very good at, uh, at winning as incumbents. So I, I'm probably a little bit more optimistic on that front than you are. We might see populists gain power, but whether they win the, the, the risk is when they win a second election, as we've seen in places like Poland and Hungary. But that tends not to happen so much. But to go back to the idea of there being three pillars to liberalism, you can see that populists tend to rebel against liberal democracy. Uh, you know, they don't like constitutions. They prefer referendums, as we saw with the Catalan nationalists. They tend to revolt against social liberalism, whether that's Trump being having an anti-immigration message, Kim Torra in uh, in Catalonia saying that. Uh, it's unnatural to speak Spanish in Barcelona, and they tend to revolt against economic liberalism, as we saw with people like Corbyn talking about you know, nationalising lots of businesses that maybe uh, would be better in the private sector. Do you think? Let's go. Let's do that then. Do you think that Spain is going to end up with a Vox government, or at least a Vox-led government? That's a that's a great question. I think probably not Vox-led. I think that Vox has, but I, looking at the polls, assuming that assuming that they stay at the same kind of levels until the, for the next couple of years or year and a half, there's a there's a strong case that the PP might have to govern with Vox. Is there but, any? Do you, do you see any risk, sort of on an analytical uh, level, of Vox getting more seats than the PP slightly? So the balance shifts on the right. Everybody thinks at the minute that that's what's going to happen. But is there a what? risk there that Vox shifts the balance enough to become the slightly more dominant force on the right? I think, let's put a percentage on it. I'd say there's a 5% chance. I don't think that's the base case at all. Uh, and I think the reason is that Vox is playing an interesting triple game it's play it's messaging has three different levels and the first level is just pure negative partisanship it's putting the boot into the catalan nationalists it's putting the boot into sanchez it's putting the boot into Poland. and obviously there's a lot that we can criticize about those movements so people get drawn to vox because they see it as the most red-blooded opposition to people that they might not necessarily disagree with and then the next level they try and pretend we're not Ultra, we're not far right, you know. We're just conservative or just Catholic. We're not ultra Catholic. We're just Catholic, and then they really are, <laughs> you know, uh, populist right, uh, hard right, uh, veering on on far right, and it's very hard to keep the messaging together. And I think it blew up a couple of weeks ago. We saw it with uh, when. Uh, uh, Abascal refused to say whether he's vaccinated or not. If he says, yes, I'm vaccinated, then the people who, the, on the first two levels, will go, oh, OK, that's fine. And he might even gain some more votes to his left. But, but the people on the kind of far right will hate it. And if he goes, I'm not vaccinated, vaccines are part of a George Soros-funded conspiracy to, I don't know, it's just like talking nonsense, his base will love it, but he won't get any upside at all. So the only thing he can do is just uh, say that he's not going to say whether he's vaccinated or not. That, kind, that, that did, kind of analysis suggests that we might even see some kind of split or battle within Vox. I think when you look at... Uh, when I was a foreign correspondent for Dow Jones and Afnar was in power, you have to sit down and analyze why Afnar was able to win such big majorities. And he just had a big tent policy. You know, he, the, uh, the PP was led by liberal conservatives. 
they govern kind of as liberals in the economic sense not so much in the social sense, a little bit traditionalist, a little bit Catholic, but they have Christian Democrats and true conservatives and even some libertarians and people on the far right kind of voting for them as the least bad option anyway. And they, Asnar did very well to keep that, that alliance together. Uh, and I think that what the what Casado is trying to do is to win back the Ciudadanos voters. He wants the Ciudadanos voters to break for the PT. Ayusha is trying to do the same thing in Madrid. You know, she's kind of realized that uh, the PP should be uh, talking about economic liberalism a lot more, and it should be uh, what's what I think a lot of people don't realize about her use. Is she's actually quite social liberal on uh, on immigration. When she when she won the election, she did a speech about how someone from Colombia can can become a madrilenio in their own way. You know, that's a, quite a surprising speech historically for for the someone on the right to make. And I think that. If the PP starts to split between the more mainstream and the nuttier side, uh, Casada will definitely try and strip off the more mainstream voters. Just to uh, bring this to a bit of a close, how do you think, actually, over those 20 or so years that you've been here, with that experience as a, as a journalist and as a philosopher and somebody who's lived in Barcelona and visited many other places in Spain, um, how, do you, how well do you think foreign media does, as a rule, in explaining all of this to their international readers because when we saw the catalan separatist crisis in 2017 especially um and what happened after that it wasn't great in many cases i agree it, it wasn't great and i think a lot of it depends on how long someone's been here when someone's just fresh off the plane you know they start writing about Franco and, you know, and uh, buying into all these narratives and, you know, they tend to be quite left-wing people who would normally vote for Podemos and quite receptive to sexist uh, narratives. But I think that the, the financial press tends to be better. The FT does a fantastic job. I don't know if you remember in 2012 when, uh, sorry, uh, 2008, when the recession was starting, the FT said that Spain was going to be really bad. And Zapatero started briefing publicly against the FT. And it turned out to be absolutely right, of course. And I think the kind of longer, uh, the longer people stay here, the better they get at seeing through some of the narrative. I would say, though, that if you had to give a prize to the worst newspaper for, for their coverage of, of, of Spain, it would have to be the New York Times. It has a really bad track record of covering Spain in a sensible way. Mr. Minder, um, do you, do you, how do you think, what, what could we who, we've been here for many, many years now, we sort of, with our own articles and, and, and stories and things, we try to do as best we can. Do you think there's anything that we could do better to, to change or to, to change, to balance out those pre, prior perceptions to better explain reality and those broad changes and how it fits into the whole? Or is it just necessarily a bit of a mess? I think it's necessarily a bit of a mess. <laughs> and uh, I, it's, a, it's a great question, though. And I tend not to, in my day job as a reporter for Merger Market, tend not to go into the politics that deep unless it kind of uh, impacts on some kind of financial situation. And I have to write it in a very kind of... Uh, neutral way. <laughs> uh, I, I think that the one thing that we have to be very careful of is not getting drawn into it as partisans. And people will always see us as partisans. You know, I, I found that during the Catalan uh, crisis, I was criticizing the, the movement, but I was basically just fact-checking them. And then people started to make all these assumptions that because I was fact-checking them, that meant that I was a Spanish nationalist or a fascist or a Vox supporter or whatever. It's absolutely, uh, completely wrong, <laughs> you know. Uh, and uh, I think partisans tend to react badly to criticism of their own side. And uh, they then assume that if you're criticizing them, that you support the people they see as the baddies. And they don't notice when you criticize other people. You know, I, I criticize Vox as much as I criticize uh, anyone. <laughs> and yet Catalan nationalists will always kind of uh, try and claim that I'm some kind of Vox supporter. I would say, in my, I would say in my experience, that I've, I've experienced that dynamic over the past few years with three groups mainly. One is the Catalan separatists, of course. 
they were very mm -hmm. vehement in that in that sense especially when it was all happening right now it's all it's died yeah. off it's died off now but when that was happening and then later on with the trial at the supreme court that they, they were very vehement in defending their positions and their identity beliefs in that manner on social media especially and they, they don't stop short of telling you what they think and of criticizing and of insulting you um but i've also experienced that with podemos uh supporters with their issues and of late especially in the past year with Vox supporters now. So I think it all ties in perhaps to this sort of business of national populism in different ways mixed with social media and technology. You got it, absolutely. And the definition, one, one book I mentioned in the, in the article, I would recommend everyone click through and buy it, is, uh, is the, the Muller's book on populism. It's a brilliant book explains it very well and you can see that the three three movements you've mentioned are populist movements and he defines populism as anti-pluralism yeah i would say that i would say, I would say so, that's right. you know what you're saying with catalan nationalists podemos and vox is that they hate pluralism and they think that if you disagree with them you're wrong you're corrupt <laughs> you know there's, there's something wrong with you that these views should be criminalized and uh it's very I think it's very difficult for those of us who believe in liberal democracy to try and educate people that that, uh, that this is not necessarily the best way of framing politics. Right. I think I, I would say that's that's right. I think I, w I was writing the I was writing the other day, and I'm, I'm sort of preparing a post now on 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 Vox and their program and their identity and how that's evolved over the past couple of years. And I would say that that's right. It's sort of it's kind of they're kind of exclusive identities, aren't they? Not in the sense of of luxury exclusive but in the sense of excluding others if you believe what we believe with the vehemence and demands that we share in our little group or tribe that's good and if not you're automatically the antagonist the enemy and we're going to go after you exactly black black hats and white hats and i've, I've noticed that I've, as you know i've followed you for years Matthew, and i think you do a great job uh, uh, and i think one thing that i've noticed is that you criticize Sanchez, criticize Podemos, criticize Catalan nationalists. And so you've got a lot of uh, Vox supporters piling into your feed and assuming that you were, you were a member of your tribe. And then you started criticizing Vox and they freaked out and couldn't handle it at all. They're like, but, but you're on our side, you know? And it's this kind of negative partisanship that if you hate these people, then you must belong to us. Right. And it's like, no, you're an independent journalist. It's not, it's your duty to criticize everyone when you think that they're making a mistake. Right. Which is what you were just describing with the separatists. And it's kind of like, well, okay, if we're describing things independently in our articles and stories and, and all the rest, sometimes, of course, that will coincide with some bit of reality and some bit of reality that those groups share. And in those circumstances in those moments those groups will come will, because they interpret everything through those lenses they think that we're automatically supporting them as opposed to just sort of uh, describing things or, 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 or analyzing things and then when we describe another bit of reality that's not in accordance with their beliefs and identity they get angry absolutely cognitive dissonance and this is the basis of my sharpen your axe project was is the cognitive dissonance I, I can explain it for people who haven't come across the term it's one of the core theories of modern psychology and it's the idea that when you feel that your identity is attacked in some way you double down on it to make the criticism go away so <laughs> and 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 i think that uh, social media has turned into a cognitive dissonance machine you know you it generates cognitive dissonance if i'm against brexit and someone comes along and says brexit's good it generates cognitive dissonance in me and i will then argue with them and that generates cognitive dissonance in them and then we both double down on our initial views and any argument becomes uh, becomes futile sterile and that's why i think these kind of conversations are much more uh, are a step forward. You know, they, I think uh, getting getting someone on the phone, looking for points of agreement, actually talking to someone uh, is, is much less general, uh, much less likely to generate uh, cognitive dissonance. So I think I think social media is kind of moving in the right direction in that sense. Yeah, I agree. That's why I wanted to start doing these conversations too. It's very Twitter is very very. Uh, it's like a, an, an often an anger generation machine sometimes, and I think with the anonymity and the speed of it, it gets everybody overexcited a lot. And and lots of people say things 
that they would never say to your face or if they met you in the street with your family or down in a bar having a beer it just wouldn't happen but because it's anonymous in many cases and, and everybody gets overexcited about these identity positions and the politics of the day people end up saying things that they would never say to your face so these I hopefully these conversations whether it's Twitter spaces like this one that we've been doing today or the yeah. YouTube visual video version if the app ever works properly again then I, I think those those kind of conversations are what we what we need to do to try and humanize it a bit and, yeah. and think a bit more together about what we all know is the case I agree and there's uh... <laughs> I, I, I read something from an economist the other day who said that where these kind of spaces work really well is instead of having two hosts, you have uh, one host, you have two hosts, because that makes it much more searching for a consensus and uh, it makes people more reluctant to be cruel or nasty to other people. So I think that's that, that's an idea that's worth playing around with as well. And this idea of this now that we're in Twitter spaces, now that we're here today because we had to abandon the other plan, um, we've got all of these readers listening to what we've been saying especially what you've been saying and mm -hmm. and so now we can go interactive so if anybody listening has a question for Rupert we can do the interactive social sure. bit and you can ask your questions as well so we've got somebody here called Barunta uh, talking about anonymity no idea Barunta <coughs> are you there let's see if Barunta Marabunta wants to speak you have to unmute your microphone, Barunta. Hello? Hello. Um, I think you haven't, uh, well, thanks very much for all this presentation. I think you haven't answered a very important question, which is, um, you said that among foreign press, the media, it's quite common the view of Spain as an authoritarian regime. Uh, I, I wouldn't use fascist, that means a completely different thing. Um, but let's say authoritarian. Um, why is it happening? Because that's a very important question. It has huge consequences. It means, for example, that a judge lost in a province in Germany decides not to send back our public enemy number one. Um, so, so I think it has to be answered. Why I, is it so successful, this view of Spain as a non-democratic country? That's my question for you guys. Thank you. Okay, Rupert, go for it, man. Why is the, why is uh, let's see. Let me put your mic back on. Uh, where's your mic? Why is it okay, Rupert? Can you un unmute your mic again? I can't unmute you. No, what happened? No, Twitter. What have you done? Rupert, can you unmute your oh, mic? Sorry, okay, yeah. there you go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, so why is yeah. the narrative of Spain as a fascist country so successful abroad and in European countries, not just with the media, but also, like Barunta just said, with people in positions of power, like, as he suggests, uh, judges? Okay, uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think it's several, several uh, overlapping reasons. It's a great question. Uh, and I think... One reason is if you look at the kind of profile of people who are interested in becoming foreign correspondents in Spain, they tend to be humanities graduates, they tend to be very left-wing, they tend to have read a little bit too much Hemingway, a little bit too much, uh, you know. <laughs> uh, they have this kind of romantic idea, they're interested in the Civil War. And so they, they're, they're kind of primed to believe these narratives. And I think that Podemos and the, uh, and, the, and the nationalists then do a great job of selling the narratives to people. They, 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 they'll probably, as soon as someone arrives, Lives. There'll be uh, people from Podemos, you know, taking them out for coffee and uh, and uh, and telling them these these stories that they that they're already quite receptive to. Yeah, I, I agree. I think I, <laughs> I agree. think there's a third level, which is that the Spanish establishment is absolutely appalling at communication. You know, so you all know when whenever you've had to do some uh, some paperwork with the uh, with the Spanish authority, that's just too much. <laughs> They're very bad at it, <coughs> and uh, they just uh, haven't really thought hard enough about how to do counter-narrative work. 
and how to, uh, you know, I've heard stories about people uh, arriving in Barcelona to write a story about Catalan separatists, and the Catalans will take them around, and the Catalan separatists will take them around to meet Omnium, to meet the ANC, to meet the parties involved, to, they'll set up a photo opportunity, they'll take them to a demo, and then they'll call up the Spanish government to say, hey, I'm doing a story for, you know, whatever publication, and no one from the government will even answer their phone call or their email. You know, it's just, it's, uh, they just drop the ball so badly on this. And there's, I think there's a lot of upside in improving that. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. The, the, um, especially that was very evident in 2017 and 2018 with the Catalan separatist <coughs> issue. They were just much better at selling their, at selling their, their version of events, which they knew fit into those pre-existing narratives and stereotypes in the minds of most foreign journalists and the Spanish government did nothing to counteract that in terms of communication policy but I think the question from Barunta was uh, in terms of what is what he was asking about the underlying things I think it's just it is it is that isn't it it's just sort of education and existing beliefs and perceptions from probably from the civil war era because that's what you get taught about Spain even at sort of the university level Following, then following through onto the Franco years and the transition and all of the rest. That's just the background that you get educated in when you get taught about Spain at somewhere abroad. And then it sort of flows into and, and sort of the, the, lit, the literature and the books and the references. They're all in that kind of thing. That's why I was asking you a few minutes ago what we could do to try to counteract that over time. It's going to be a re it would be a really long term effort not to sell the other version, especially, but just to increase awareness of the existence of other versions and different ways of explaining reality. That, that's a really interesting observation, Matthew, and I think that there's a deeper point, which is why don't people learn about the transition? You know, it's a little bit boring. <laughs> you know, it's like some people sat around in a darkened room and came up with an agreement, you know. And I think one of the big biggest failures of the of Spanish democracy is that they didn't turn the transition into a national myth in the way that, you know, as as British people, the Second World War and Britain standing alone and the way the NHS was built after the war and, you know, anti fascism and defending democracy and dismantling the empire that became the founding myth and i'm not saying that you that, that spain should necessarily carve the faces of the founders of the constitution uh, the fathers of the constitution into mountains as they did in in america with, with, with mount rushmore but there certainly should be uh, museums of the transition and more streets named after the fathers and, and and films made about them and you know people shouldn't be able to graduate from laeso without understanding what the constitution is and why it happened and and uh, some of the some of the story behind it you know uh, but i think that probably should have happened in the 1970s and 80s and i think it's maybe too late to do that now great andres has a question andres are you there unmute your microphone i am good morning guys thanks for organizing hey very quick question so we've been talking a lot about what spain can maybe learn from other countries and how Spain compares to other countries. It would be also interesting to talk about what Spain can teach other countries. I think, at least in Spain, we care way too much about what other people think about us. Uh, but maybe there's a few things we can show other people. So it would be interesting to, to hear your thoughts. And thanks again for organizing. Great. Thanks, Andres. Rupert. Absolutely. Great question. And I think that Spain should definitely try and export the transition. As we mentioned before, Venezuela, you know, if you could turn the transition into a template for how to turn an authoritarian regime into a democratic mission, regime, you know, and, and teach that to countries that want to make the, make the same step, you know, I think there'd be massive potential there. Uh, and, and it's a shame that it's never really uh, happened. I think I think so as well. I think as well, it's, it's, it's a difficult question, isn't it? It's a difficult way to, I mean, how would you do that in practice? Because these preconceived ideas and perceptions of Spain that have existed for decades and that are taught at all levels about Spain abroad sort of create that, the, the lenses, don't they? they create the lens through which people see Spain. So if you come in with those ideas, it's very difficult to be aware of or accept or contemplate other bits of Spain that, like Andres says, could be illustrative to p 
people abroad, especially with things that, I don't know, uh, you could you could go right uh, very historical with this and sort of how, how many people outside of Spain, even people who study Spain are aware of, I don't know, the evolution of the school of Salamanca and economics or something like that. Or what about these ideas now about the, the new ideas about the Inquisition or this identity polit politics business now it's all, it's all mixed together in a very complicated way of what really happened with the Spanish discovery and conquest of South America and was it all about rape and pillage and conquest or was it as some people are now suggesting less to do with that and more about more to do with Spain bringing civilization to the natives um, or things that happen nowadays as well in terms of technology because there, there are loads of stories about technology say and what happens with Spain and Spaniards and technology and how they're using it or inventing it that make great stories and examples uh, which people in other countries would resonate with immediately because it's just another example uh, in it of how people in a country, in this case Spain, use those new technologies and try to deal with those new technologies in interesting ways. Uh, if, I can, if I can add something there before we go on to another question, uh, there are, if you look at Iberia rather than Spain, there are three great cities in Iberia for startups. There's Barcelona, there's Madrid, and there's Lisbon. And there's just fantastic, amazing innovation happening every day. Uh, a recent example in, in Barcelona, Wallbox became a... Um, became a unicorn with a billion dollar plus valuation you know they they, they have a system of, of charging electric vehicles but then you can do reverse charging and you can take the energy out of the vehicle and put it sell it back into the grid i mean it's it's just amazing stuff and we don't hear nearly enough about this in in spain while while we've got you here and you're a business reporter do you know of any a question i've got do you know of anywhere in spain any city or town in spain that is being especially innovative with cryptocurrencies at the minute. Is there anywhere in Spain that's trying to become the capital of crypto in Spain? I haven't come across much crypto in Spain and I don't write about crypto very much. I have written a little bit about it. I think one issue with crypto that I think you should definitely put on your radar, Matthew, is that the, the fraud in crypto. They're, they're, well, coming to, to it from a mainstream finance background, Everything in finance is regulated, and there are rules and regulations, and you know banks have know your customer rules and uh, money laundering laws and uh, and so forth. But with crypto, because it's all decentralized, uh, lots of criminals use it to launder money and so forth. Lots of con artists use it to, with these get rich schemes where you know they sell you this vision of becoming a millionaire, and they just take a skim a little bit off, to, off the top and, on, on the commission and disappear. I think that's a huge issue in in crypto, and. I think that I, I'm probably slightly biased coming to from a mainstream finance background, but you know I think that once you start to get some regulation into crypto, uh, it will. That's when you'll start to see it take off because that's when uh, you know kind of convention people with a lot of money, conventional uh, pension funds or whatever, can start getting involved in it in a in a really serious way. Uh, you know, once they know that the person on the other on the other side of the deal isn't a money launderer or a terrorist or whatever, they can relax and, and get involved with it. So uh, I think there's going to be a lot of interesting conversations about about regulation, and this will mainly be based on the SEC. So two stories that I'd suggest keeping an keeping an eye, an eye out uh, on. One is tether. Tether is a stable coin. So people, it's uh, one tether equals one dollar. And if you want to buy Bitcoin, you normally you sell your euros, buy a tether, and then you sell your tether and buy a bitcoin. And there have been lots of allegations of fraud around tether. And people who know about these kind of things are very worried about it because if tether falls apart, that might have very serious consequences throughout the whole crypto world. So, you know, uh, anyone who's interested in, 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 in Bitcoin should be keeping an eye on the, te on the tether situation, thinking about how you should cover your positions if, if, if that blows up nothing proven yet uh so uh, uh obviously there are lots of ongoing court cases and investigations and so forth uh and the, the the other thing to keep an eye on is is the sec and to what extent it will it will uh uh regulate uh crypto whether that's tokens or bitcoin or whatever and i think a lot of the bitcoin evangelists see regulation as a bad thing but in 
fact, it will probably regulation is where Bitcoin will really, uh, where crypto will really take off. Yeah, they're going to do. It, it looks like they're going to do a Bitcoin futures ETF on the Nasdaq this very week. But anyway, we'll what? see. We can do crypto in Spain on another conversation. That, I mean, crypto in Spain. That get, that's we could do ten space conversations about that. We can do that an, an, uh, as a thing another day. Yeah. Qu more questions. Sripal, Lorne, Jesus, and Fernando. Sripal, are you there? Yeah, yeah, Matthew. Great, go can for you it. Hear me? Yeah, go for it. Indian, dipl yeah, Indian uh, diplomat, sir. Where are you from? Yeah, Matthew. Uh, uh, and uh, I was, uh, 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 it was kind of you, uh, kind on your part to host this. And I have, a, uh, uh, it, it, your reporting has helped me a lot through this uh, for a lot for the last year in Spain. And my question is related to uh, Europe and Spain. We see uh, the political spectrum of Spain getting more fractured, and we, as uh, Rupert has mentioned, that uh, the center left and center right has more in common uh, 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 when compared to the extreme left and the center left. Uh, when it comes to Europe, can Europe push through push through some understanding between the parties in Spain uh, because uh, there is a need for greater reform in pension system and public spending in Spain? And how does the how does this fracture worry Europe in long term? Thank you. Okay, go for it, Rupert. Can Europe push through help to push through reform in Spain's fractured politics? I uh, my hi. Can you hear me? Hello, Rupert. Hello. Yep. Sorry, uh, I had a problem with my microphone there. Uh, I'm not sure that Europe has the will or the ability to do that uh, I think that as long as Sanchez is in uh, is in place as head of the so, uh, the socialist I will bet across uh, bet against any any kind of uh, uh, initiatives that, that, that bridge the great divide in Spanish politics I mean if you look at covid Sanchez tried to manage the covid situation without a real majority it was a very strange decision. He could, he would have been perfectly justified in creating a national unity government. The fact that he didn't do it in such a bad crisis <laughs> suggests that he would never do it. So uh, I, 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 I would be pessimistic on seeing any change for maybe 10 years on that front. I, I think I would agree. So this fits into what we were saying before about uh, the, the change in political situation globally and that, uh, therefore in every European country too. I mean, last weekend with the, at the Vox event, uh, they had video messages from different countries in South America and from the Polish Prime Minister and the Prime Minister of Hungary, Mr. Orban, as well as the physical presence and speech speakers of people like Giorgia Meloni from Italy and uh, I think it was Andres Cruz of it. I can't, the, uh, Portuguese, the Portuguese equivalent of Abascal was there too. And I can't remember what his name is now, sorry. But they, the, so these identity issues and technology issues and social media issues are present, as far as I can see, in every European country. Every country is trying to have to deal with them at the same time. And I think it makes politics more difficult for the politicians because they can't move from those trenches. Because every, they know how this works because they try to use it to their advantage so they combine their tv appearances whether it's on uh, on the tv news or on the live stream from congress for example with their twitter operations and only seconds after they say something in congress or on tv the tweets with the videos are already there for their followers to retweet and amplify in different ways which is good for them in terms of trying to get more followers and more voters but it's very bad for politics as a whole because it means none of them can come out of their trenches because their own supporters will jump on top of them. And I think, so if we go back to, say, I don't know, the 2000s uh, or the late 90s when Aznar and Pujol or Aznar and the Basques could do deals in a hotel in Barcelona and fix whatever problem needed to be fixed and then announce to the media and to Spain that it was fixed and let's all keep going together... Uh, and that that was the way old politics worked. But I think over the past 10 years, that's changed a lot. And it's now not possible, especially look at what happened from 2015 and 2016 with the elections and coalitions. It just wasn't possible for them 
They weren't used to it at all anyway in terms of doing coalitions in general, but there was, it was just stuck for years. And look at what's not really happened since then. I think we're still in that era. So I think the chances of Europe being able to force something like that, it's not like when Europe... The, one of the only times the Spanish constitution was changed, well, I think it was in 2011, wasn't it, just before the elections, when the European Central Bank sent a letter to Zapatero and said, change the constitution now for deficit spending or something, Article 135. Yeah. And they did it in about two days, oh, no, two, not literally two days, but they did it very quickly compared to the rest of Spanish politics. And then we had the elections and it all started to change. But they did it, I think, with that old system. So the, so, the, the socialists and the... PP got together behind the scenes, as it were, did the deal, make sure, made sure there was going to be enough votes for that, and, and, then they, and off they went for that. And after that, it all started to unravel. And I don't think that kind of politics is possible anymore. Anyway, question from... I agree. And can I just add one thing quickly there? A brilliant book that I would recommend to everyone who's listening to this is uh, The Myth of the Rational Voter by Brian Kaplan. He's an economist, he's libertarian, so he's coming from a certain angle. But he says that the big, tra the big problem of politics is that politicians have to decide between what sounds good, which is generally more populist, and what makes people richer, which is generally more kind of mainstream politics, uh, economic liberalism and so forth. And he says that you, you just have to choose. If you say, if you go down the kind of things that sound good route, you might win an election, but it'll be very difficult to govern. And if you do the kind of, we'll, we'll try and make people so they've got a little bit of money in their wallet at the end of the month, uh, you will never, you'll sound, uh, you'll never sound as good as the, as the populace. Uh, uh, and you'll, your people will distrust you. And that's, basically what's driving this kind of trench warfare that Matthew was describing uh, a second ago. Yeah, and, po and, po and in terms of attention and media and social media, populist politics like that, divisive populist politics is more exciting. Exactly. It goes straight for your heart and soul and your emotions and, you know, big narratives and raise your voice and wave your hands around a bit. It's great. It, it will win you an election and it will win you a referendum. It won't necessarily make society better. Right, who who wants to talk about boring centrist pension policies for the next 30 years? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, we need to cut taxes a bit on these people and then do this and spend that. And, you know, I'm sorry, everyone's already gone to sleep. Right, next question. Lorne, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. It's not really a, a question. It's more of an observation. I, I agree with much of both of what you've said. Um, I've, I've been in Barcelona myself since 2007, and yeah, I, I recall when the secession movement was, was very minor back in those days, and, and it surprised me how, how much uh, leverage is, it has gained since then. Now, I actually teach uh, self-determination uh, here at a private university in Barcelona, and um, one thing I, I impress upon students, and that's about self-determination, we, we cover various secession movements. To varying, with varying degrees of success uh, across the world. And one thing I, I make clear in the very first class, and, and you, you may detect from my accent that I'm Australian, um, to, to prohibit secession is the, the vast majority of nation states prohibit secession. They, they explicitly, um, either explicitly prohibit it in their constitution or in their laws, uh, and, and even my own country, Australia, the preamble of our constitution says the country is indissoluble. And many Spaniards here think that because Spain is not flexible in that regard to, to whether it's Catalonia or the Basque country or wherever, that makes them inherently fascist. When I remind students, and some of them already know this, if not particularly Australia, but other places, but when I remind them that this is the case, um, it's it's it can surprise some of them, and 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 it doesn't mean that Australia is is a fascist state or, or indeed a Franco state for for making this very clear in the first paragraph of our most important law. So that's something I, I'm I'm always very quick to to point out in in my courses, uh, and and also what what we were saying there with um, what you were saying earlier with. Um, talking about El Jueves, the, the satirical magazine El Jueves, I too started to read that when, when I was first here to, to improve my Spanish because it was 
it was all quite colourful pictures and it, and it informed me a little bit about politics. And, um, yeah, it, it very much became a sort of central government bashing uh, magazine. S same too when I, when I moved to Catalonia, because originally I was in, in Zaragoza first, um, I started watching TV3 to, to learn Spanish and to learn more about the region where I, I'd chosen to live. And, and very quickly, you, you, I made the realisation that rather than being a neutral um, Catalan language uh, broadcasting outlet, it was a bashing bashing Spain outlet. And that, that sort of disappointed me, that, that surprised me and then, and then disappointed me. Um, but it's, it's funny, what, and what you were just touching on just before about things being, being emotional. Um, populism is based on emotion and it, they're always emotional arguments. I, I consider the, the Catalan independence movement it seems to have more in common with Brexit rather than the Scottish independence movement. Uh, I, I would argue that both Brexit and the Catalan movement are, are quite emotional movements. And again, when you try to pull it down to facts and figures and stats, that people find that very boring. They find you know, the status quo or constitutionalism or or just looking at things from a legal or even a pragmatic perspective does not elicit much emotion. And that, that only gets you so far. Lauren, so um, yes. uh, you, you say you're from uh, Australia and, uh, yes. and Rupert was mentioning there that uh, you, during the conversation that it's interesting to try to compare Spain to other countries. I don't know yeah. if you're in your experience over the past few years, you've had a go at sort of comparing Catalan separatism and what happened with Catalan separatism to Australia and say, would it be, would it in your sort of understanding of the two countries and cultures, would it even be possible for anything like Catalan separatism to happen in Australia with, I'm just going to invent this and say, I don't know, like the, uh, the, the Queensland separatist movement or the New South Wales Revolutionary Front wants to do a separate state. Is that kind of thing in Australia even possible? Well, it does, Matthew. But it does, Matthew. But you're on the wrong coast. There is a movement in Western Australia. Uh, it's only about ten percent, uh, but which, which is a, which is a small minority. But uh, as I just said, and as we all just noticed um, in Catalonia not so long ago, it was only about ten or fifteen percent as well. Now, this is in Western Australia, which uh, when Australia federated two uh, hundred and twenty-one years ago, one hundred and twenty years ago, Western Australia actually voted no to joining the Federation. Before that, you had six separate British colonies. Now they're six separate states uh, with few territories added on. Um, they were always reluctant. And in the 30s, they were actually allowed to have a non-binding referendum back in the 30s. And again, what was significant about the 30s? The 30s was the, the global depression, the economic hardship. Australia was hit disproportionately hard. West Australia disproportionately hard within Australia. So it's not unusual that these movements come to a head in, in periods of, of, of unrest and, and uncertainty and you know, hip pocket uh, pressure. But um, they had a referendum, it was, it was overwhelmingly successful, but at the same time, the government that pushed the referendum on secession for Western Australia, uh, they had the state election on the same day and they lost overwhelmingly. So uh, in some ways it was seen as a, as a barometer of, of feeling rather than genuine uh, secession movement. As I said, it was, it was non-binding, but there is still that movement there. And I did meet as part, I'm also doing a PhD at the moment on, on secession referendums. And I did meet the leader of the Western Australian secession movement. And I met him in his office in Perth. And it, you do find there are similarities. All, all secession movements, all these breakaway movements, they, they do have similarities. But of course, in, in my opinion, you know, some of them have much more merit than, than others. And right. I think the West Australia one has less, less than other ones. And perhaps Catalonia has more. But, you know, comparing it to some places like Kurdistan, for example, or other regions. And, and one thing with my studies... Um, you know, there's literally hundreds of secession movements or separate separatist movements around the world uh, as we speak. Um, but just because it's prohibited doesn't make a country fascist or, or Francoist. Mm. Yes. 
can I just briefly interrupt? I've got very interesting points, and I think you you said something that is very insightful, which is that campaigning for the status quo is boring. And that is absolutely the, the the problem that we have with with Brexit. The 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 campaign to remain was very poor. It was all based on numbers, you know, wow, the economy might go down a bit. And the other side were talking about identities and using big words like sovereignty and, you know, waving flags around. And uh, I think the Remain campaign could have done much better. For example, talking about war and people going off to fight in Europe and bringing people together and, you know, uh, and the opportunities for young people to go off and live in Europe, as Matthew and, and myself did, you know. And uh, I, I think it was, uh, I think there was a clear lesson there for anyone who uh, is campaigning against the populist movement that you need to engage with people's, uh, with people's emotions and you need to tell stories. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Lorne, for your comments there. Jesus has a question. Um, hello, guys. Are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah, no problem. Okay, uh, thank you for organizing. I actually have two questions. Um, the first question is about the complexity of our uh, federal system or so-called uh, autonomy systems, whether you think the fact that we are willing to express or show to the world how uh, we uh, move from, from, from the Franco's regime to a democracy and we were willing to, to give powers to the regions have somehow damaged our image um, across the world, uh, precisely because um, if I compare with other countries or other federal countries like Germany, um, the federal states still have power and control over education and and um, other important factors that actually impede those regions from attacking somehow um, the the central state. And that's my question number one. And the so, shall we take? Shall we take? Shall we take that question first, and then go on to the second question? Okay, that's fine. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, the, I think if you, you know, Matthew and I have been talking about the importance of constitutions, and I think that's true. But we have to be critical as well. And I think that the, one of the uh, big problems with the Spanish constitution, I'd say, two big problems with it. One was that in the 1970s they were distrustful of the concept of independent uh, bodies. And so you got things like uh, political parties appointing judges, which is causing lots of problems now. And I think that that part of the constitution was badly designed. But I think one part of the constitution that was badly designed was not defining clearly enough where the limits of the commu autonomous community's power lay, you know, because by not doing that, that meant that the nationalists are always able to try and push the envelope. We want this, we want this, we want a concession, we want education, we want taxes, we want that. And so they gradually push it and there's no clear idea of where the limits lie. Uh, and I think I think that's a, a failure. Of, while I think the constitution is generally very good, you know, it, it, it lacks uh, some of the details. Will maybe uh, could have been improved. Matthew, do you, do you agree I, with that? I think I think most people outside of Spain, most people, even even most people who have studied Spain a bit or quite a lot, would have difficulties explaining what Spanish regions really are and how they work uh, administratively in terms of their powers and uh, legal options and all the rest of it um uh, as mu that's... much in the same way as uh, your average spaniard even who even one who has studied england a bit but or, or germany or you know, some or the, or, or the united states would, would have difficulty explaining in a few sentences the differences between i don't know cornwall and scotland or northern ireland and manchester so I think that's a problem uh, for the start because then when what happened with the Catalan separatist issue was the Catalan separatists came along with their very good foreign media marketing campaign and for years pounded this idea that Catalonia is a nation and a country and it's oppressed by fascist Spain and because of the preconceived existing ideas that most foreign people have of Spain anyway from the civil war through the Franco period uh, and then you've got these Catalan separatists who come along and say that Catalonia is actually a nation and it's oppressed by fascist Spain. And nobody understands how Spanish regions work anyway. So they just sort of went for that. It's not, not precisely because we wanted to show the world that we were actually a democracy 
and they're actually turning against us now because we got uh, the Catalans attacking the um, the states. And uh, if we compare with Germany's uh, constitution, for instance, it says obviously the the landers got cruel power, except uh, if that power or that uh, kind of 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 or actions uh, attack the federal state. In that case, you know that power is, is immediately withdrawn, and we don't have that in our constitution. You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, I think I think yeah. you can have we can have that sort of enlightened debate if we are political scientists or journalists who have followed these events very closely over the past few years, or legal scholars or something like that. But for for 99% of ordinary people in the different countries. They just don't understand don't, yeah. how other countries are organized in those terms. So when the exciting populist narrative that Rupert was talking about comes along mm -hmm. with flags and emotion and identity and we want freedom like in Braveheart or something and everybody can understand that in three minutes on the nighttime news or two minutes on an internet article. And that's something that people can understand and they're just not going to understand compared to that all of these legal complexities about how administrative levels work in different comparative democracies. Um, and my second question is about the um, uh, judicial situation of, of Puigdemont and um, of the Catalan leaders. Um, basically, after what happened to Poland and the um, national legislation war against the European legislation, um, as the uh, refusal of the arrest warrant by Belgium was, was based on a national legislation rather than a European legislation situation. So what do you think about that? Rupert? Oh, that's a good complex question. <laughs> <laughs> a good simple question with a complex answer. I think uh, the European rules on extradition are written in such a way that if you go and kill someone, then it's very easy, it should be very easy to get extradition because the rules against murder are uh, pretty much the same everywhere. But when you deal with more complex kind of uh, complex uh, crimes, it's much harder because you have this idea of double criminality. So uh, the thing needs to be illegal in the country where the, where the crime was committed and illegal in the country where the guy has been arrested. And for historical reasons, uh, the legislation against regional leaders breaking constitution tends to be tends to be drafted differently in different countries and that's the, the, the kind of underlying problem with 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 push to mind uh, i think there's an issue now that the other people who were accused of the same crimes and found guilty have been pardoned and let out of prison it kind of makes it a bit weird why would you extradite this guy for him to go through a whole crime and then he's going to be pardoned anyway? So, you know, the, 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 the whole thing is very, very messy. I do think, though, that Puigdemont is doesn't have the best tactics in this he should be, he uh, as soon as uh Junqueras and co got 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 pardoned he should have rushed back to spain and had his tried to do his pleaded guilty to everything and had his crime uh had his uh, his case done as quickly as possible just to make sure that uh that he is found guilty while the socialists are still in power <laughs> the opinion polls suggest that that <laughs> might not necessarily be the case in I, I think, I think I and it most most likely because many people don't know about this case in depth uh, as i do know because i've been researching and basically what i know at this stage is a uh, belgian uh, denied the um, extradition based on a national law uh, yeah. and not the european law the european law actually says the opposite uh, and uh, and the uh, supreme court uh, issued a prejudicial question to the European justice and that question is going to be positive for Spain um, and, and that's almost 100% certain so uh, Belgium is going to be in a position where they have to uh, extradite or they have to analyze the double criminality I'm not so going to say it's going to be 100% extradition but they will have to analyze and uh, the situation so if that happens when there is a transition from uh, socialist to um, uh, central right parties in Spain, maybe his situation is going to be more complex. 
Right, I think I still want to see, uh, Rupert, I don't know if you come across this at some point in your investigations up in, in Catalonia, I still want to see the last WhatsApp messages between Puigdemont and Junqueras in, from 2017. <laughs> I, 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 I want over, to see the Netflix of that patient. Over, over, over <laughs> that. Uh, uh, the word on the street is that there was some colourful language when uh, when it emerged that Puigdemont had, 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 had yeah, gone they, to Brussels. Just, just, over, <laughs> just over that last weekend after they declared independence and then instead, instead of, if they if they'd have if they'd have done a kind of Catalan spring and physically surrounded Puigdemont in the, in the San Jaume after that day, it might have been different. But they all, Puigdemont just went for beers around Girona and that was it. And then on the, a couple of days later, Junqueras was at the Supreme Court and Puigdemont was in Belgium. So I want, if you ever come across those WhatsApp messages, let me know. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, yes, it, it could be. Let's let's do one last question now from Fernando, and then it's time for everybody to go for Sunday lunch. Fernando, is Fernando there? Hello, Fernando. Fernando, have you have to unmute your microphone? Hello, Fernando. Hola, hello. Hello, go. Yes, um, so I have a question for uh, Rupert. It's a question, but he needs uh, some context first. Um, you, I think you mentioned earlier on something about negative partisanship. Is that right? That's um, right. So my basically my my question is well, well of course we see a uh, negative partisanship in Spain like in in rallies in uh, Congress in Madrid Assembly uh, we've seen it in election campaigns. My question is: Do you think that uh, partisanship and parliamentarism in Spain could be seen as more aggressive than in other EU countries or? average aggressive or um it, not as aggressive as we think it is it's a great question i'm not going to give you a straightforward answer i'm afraid because i think uh, that that's probably a phd thesis right there <laughs> uh, uh, my my impression is that it's probably less uh, in a country like germany where you get a social democrat serving in a conservative-led government but you see Fairly similar things in the UK. Uh, I, I first realized about negative partisanship uh, when I met a guy who was a privately educated Englishman and he used to go around very posh and he used to go around calling everyone comrade and said he was a communist and he supported Labour and then he announced he was a liberal and he supported the Liberal Democrats and he's now become a Scottish nationalist and he's learning to play the bagpipes. None of this makes sense. The only way it makes sense is when you think that he's privately educated, posh Englishman, and he's rebelling against the Tories. And he's just choosing someone who he sees as being antagonistic to the Tories. And uh, when, when I realised that was what was going on, a light bulb went off over my head, and I went and did lots of reading on negative partisanship. And I think you see it a lot in Spain uh, in the sense that why do the left and the nationalists... Um, uh, find common ground and the reason is that they just hate the pp and the monarchy <laughs> that's the only thing they've got in common you know and uh, that, that, that's a kind of uh, why when you look at the fault line we, we've talked about the fault line between the left and the right the nationalists fall on the left side but they're not left wing even if they claim to be nationalism tends to be a right wing movement i th i and, think uh, right rupert i yeah. i watched over the summer talking about this i i re-watched Borgen, the Danish series Borgen on Netflix about Danish politics and that which was very well known and well received in 2012 and 2013 wasn't it and everybody Very serious 100% recommended yeah and and people over the uh, uh, especially in Catalonia there were lots of references for, during that separatist period I mean, we want to be the sort of Denmark of the south and all of that business because of that kind of vision we have of, or perception we have of Denmark but it struck me it struck me watching it again over the summer that politics has already moved on. That it seemed, it seemed almost a bit antiquated already, and it was only seven or eight years ago. And the politics mm -hmm. that we have nowadays, with Twitter and live streams and all the rest of it, is just another level of tone and excitement and uh, and vindictiveness. If we're talking about the clash of polarized 
identities. It, we've gone to another level. And I don't know what it's like in Denmark at the minute, whether there's a Danish version of Abbas Gal against a Danish version of Rufian and Sanchez or something like that. And if the volume is the same or similar. But I would say that watching that, comparing that to Dan Danish politics seven or eight years ago, as it was represented in the TV show anyway, uh, th this is just another level and a different level of volume and, and vindictiveness. Okay, I haven't seen the series, but it's an interesting point. Matthew, before we wrap things up, can I just say one last thing? And I'd just like to talk about you. Uh, but I think I've followed you for years, and I think that people outside journalism maybe don't appreciate quite how difficult it is to generate quite so much content as you, as you do on a daily basis. You have my total respect, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the amount of content that you produce every day is spectacular. It shows great drive, great work ethic and it implies to me you've got a cold you've argued with your partner you haven't slept well and you're still going out and producing and producing and producing and for me that just has huge amounts of merit and i'd just like to publicly congratulate you on that because i think it's great and i don't think that ne non-journalists necessarily appreciate quite how hard you work <laughs> that, well thanks very much we that's very very <laughs> kind of you to say so um i i don't know i just it's just what i enjoy enjoy doing uh, for for me and for everybody else i think it's a a useful thing to do and and it helps us all hopefully understand spain a little bit better uh, and how it's changing over over years uh, but you're right as, as soon as you once you get stuck into a story especially if you go out and try and record record things and meet people as soon as you go out and start doing that you, you just hours and hours and hours and hours and hours so Thank, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Also, let's let's wrap it up there. It's time for Sunday lunch for everybody. Uh, so let's go and do that. Thank you all for listening. Thank you all for commenting and asking your questions. I like this idea of conversations. I think we need to do more of them precisely because of what Rupert was saying during the conversation that we need to humanize what's going on a bit more and, and sort of get off that Twitter anonymity a bit. So I'm going to do more of these both as spaces and as streamed video interviews or chats uh, in on YouTube and, and that kind of thing, both in English and in Spanish with people who know what they're talking about a little bit. So thank you, Rupert. Thank you to everybody for asking your questions and for listening for the past hour, hour and a half or so. I will put the podcast version of this up this afternoon over lunch. Thank you, Matthew. Have a great Sunday lunch.